good day, everybody. But you're looking well. I mean, you're. you're... Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, second day of the Tavole Aperte. Uh, uh, we are happy to have everybody uh, here. And uh, first of all, I want to welcome our uh, artists, uh, guests at this uh, lunch today. Uh, Paolo Bruschi uh, from Brazil and uh, Francis Eupertured uh, uh, from uh, New Zealand, but uh, I understand you live in London, right? That's right. <laughs> so, um, and uh, they are two of the artists exhibiting in the, this year's exhibition curated by Christine Marcel. Uh, um, Paolo Bruschi uh, has uh, done a performance today and part of his work is uh, right uh, uh, here in front of us. Um, and uh, his work is part of the pavilion of the artists and the books. Uh, while uh, Frances Youprichard, uh, you can see her work uh, at the Arsenale in the Corderia uh, in the Pavilion of the Traditions. Uh, I thank also all our guests here for lunch. Uh, this is um, an event that Christine Marcel really wanted uh, for this exhibition as uh, a very uh, informal uh, way of uh, having a conversation with the artists and giving the chance uh, uh, to the public uh, uh, to have a lunch uh, and uh, ask questions and get to know uh, the artists, the way they work, especially the, their practice uh, as artists. Um, so uh, we will be having uh, these tavole aperte for the, the, during the whole exhibition until the end of November. Uh, and you are free uh, to come back whenever you wish. Uh, and um, well, uh, of course, this is not only for conversation, it's also lunch. So uh, please feel free uh, to serve yourself. Uh, and um, we, I'll, I'll start um, saying two things uh, about the two artists, or better asking them, because I know Paolo Bruschi, it is uh, your first time, I think, uh, at the Venice Biennale. Second? Okay. Uh, 1977. In 1977. Swiss, Swiss <laughs> Sorry. In the Swiss Pavilion. In the Swiss Pavilion, okay. Uh, and uh, for Francis Eupertured, uh, I know that you were here uh, with the national participation of New Zealand uh, in 2009, if That's I right. recall uh, right. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us something about this year's exhibition and the work you uh, chose for? Uh, uh, to bring uh, this year to the Biennale, and also how did this work uh, with uh, uh, the curator? Were you choosing, was the curator choosing? Did you choose to which pavilion, uh, in which pavilion you wanted your art to be exhibited? Uh, or was it a suggestion of Christine Marcel uh, to put each one of you in the two different uh, uh, pavilions? Um, maybe I should start while she explains what you're saying. Um, Christine, I think I maybe met Christine quite late as an artist because I had been in New Zealand and we couldn't meet. So when I got to meet her, she, I think she really knew exactly where she wanted me to be, which was in the traditions area, in the Arsenale. And all I asked was for the most bricky area possible because I really loved the, the naked architecture of that space. And so for me, much better to be in a space that's not trying to be a white gallery or anything, but just is in the actual um, architecture that's natural there anyway. And um, uh, when I realized there were only two um, guards in the entire arsenale, I changed my ideas of my work a bit because I think people with backpacks and my fragile works is pretty dangerous. So that's why I've got a really big, like a bit like this table actually. It's actually a similar size. 
My, um, I've got a big grey plinth, and my works are bolted onto that, so no one can swipe it with a backpack. But um, I don't need to worry about them being delicate as well. What about you? Is your, is your work very different from um, 1977 when I was one? <laughs> <laughs> Esse, esse, o convite é, foi uma casualidade. Eu, eu queria salientar que eu, eu fico contente de estar no pavilhão internacional pela situação crítica que passa o Brasil. Não, no pavilhão internacional eu participo tranquilo, porque o, o, o Brasil sofreu um golpe recentemente. E eu, eu me recuso, por exemplo, a representar o Brasil... Me recusaria a representar o Brasil aqui na Bienal de Veneza, porque o Brasil passa, depois do golpe, por uma situação muito complicada. A direita volta ao poder, o Exército apoiando a direita, e isso, para mim, é uma, é uma coisa vergonhosa. Quero deixar esse registro contra a situação que o país passa no momento, que o Brasil passa no momento. Que é muito importante para ele estar participando na área internacional do Bienal, porque o Brasil apenas sofreu um coup. And we have a return of the right and of the military, and he would have refused to participate in the National Pavilion. And he wants to make it very clear that his country is going through a very difficult situation, and it's very important for him to have been in the international area of the Biennial. In the 70s, I was arrested three times by the military dictator, who me persecuted my life toda in Brazil. In the 1970s, I was jailed three times due to the military dictatorship, and I was persecuted the majority of my life. E a minha participação na Bienal de Veneza foi uma coisa muito engraçada, porque Irina, que está sentada ali, levanta você. Ela é, é a culpada de eu estar na Bienal, porque ela conheceu Marcel em Paris, com uma amiga em comum, e passou o meu livro Poieses para Marcel. E Marcel me contou aqui em Veneza que disse assim, que saco, mais uma, uma pessoa que tem um artista na família, eu não aguento mais isso. E depois que ela analisou o livro, então ela foi atrás de minha obra e entrou em contato, e então e surgiu toda essa história, que para mim foi, foi uma participação muito, muito genial. And uh, it was by chance that he's in this biannual, and it has to do with Irina, who so, <laughs> sitting over there, who ran into Christine Marcel and said, you have to see Paulo's work, and gave his book, Poesies. And Christine later said, ah, terrible, another person who has an artist in the family. But then looked at the book and started researching, and that was how the invitation came about. And, and um, how did the, the period from the Swiss Pavilion find your work in 77? Em 77, é, Johnny Amilet é do Fluxo, do Grupo Fluxo, que eu tinha correspondência já, contato com... que eu me correspondi com o Grupo Gutai e o Grupo Fluxo desde o início dos anos 70. E Johnny Amilet foi o curador, do, do, um dos curadores do pavilhão da Suíça, e ele abriu o, um espaço dentro do pavilhão para outras nacionalidades. Então, convidou alguns artistas de alguns países para representar a Suíça. Então, ele abriu o espaço, foi uma proposta interessante, eu acho que foi a primeira vez no Bienal que um artista abre o espaço para outros países, para outros artistas. E ele me convidou, eu tenho toda a documentação do, do, do convite, da envio das obras. Uh, Jona Meleda, of Fluxus. Um, Paulo was very involved with Gutai and Fluxus, and at the time, he was one of the curators of the Swiss Pavilion, and he opened a space within the pavilion to have other international artists. Paolo thinks it might have been one of the first times that there were other nationalities being shown within the Swiss Pavilion. And so he was shown with male art. Male art. Para finalizar, essa, essa, essa performance, essa instalação, é de 1973, que eu enviei com um telex, um trabalho pioneiro em telex art, e que foi exposto apenas o telex. Então, de 73, ela vem ser realizada agora, pela primeira vez aqui na Bienal, que arte se embala como se quer. E eu nunca justifico o meu trabalho. Isso é um, uma instalação que ela em si, ela em si fala, fala tudo. Acho que cada um que tire suas conclusões, porque 
é uma, uma obra em aberto, cada um ter suas suas conclusões. So the work that he did here is a, a work that he did in 1973 in a telex that he sent uh, called Art is Packed Any Way You Like It. And it's being realized for the first time today. And he never defines his work. He thinks that it's evident and also everyone should interpret it as they wish. And now I have nothing left to say. I just, I'm going to just do. Wonderful shirt. <laughs> Venice, this city was disinfected against art. It's actually more detailed than you think. You can see lots of can you show lines it to us? from the tongue. <laughs> okay. And they're quite different too. <laughs> it's his performance linguistic poem. And it's a signed edition. Fantastic. Wonderful. It's fantastic. Now, I particularly like the tongue with the green and the blues melting together. When I was thinking about this lunch, um, I was thinking about how different our practices are because I'm one of those artists that goes to the studio, you know, most days. And um, I make work with my hands. And I think Paolo makes work, obviously not with his hands always. <laughs> okay. And, um, and I, I work very intuitively, but I think Paolo works very intellectually. We, yeah, we've got a totally different artistic process. Yeah. And how was... Uh, how different was your making of this year's Biennale uh, compared to the one you did in 2009 for the New Zealand Pavilion? Uh, quite a lot more relaxed, actually, <laughs> because um, I'm a bit older. That was eight years ago. And I was kind of nervous about it last time. And this time, it, without the country representation, it's a little bit easier. A lot less sort of bureaucracy and things like that on your back. And I could just make the work myself in the studio. And so I actually made about twice as many sculptures as what you see. And um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think I just sort of worked quite freely and quite quickly. Yeah, the context is really different, isn't it? Because yeah, when you look at the history, could you? Excuse me, could you please take the yeah. microphone because otherwise nobody can hear the question. I was, I was just, just saying to Francis, it's really different obviously because when, uh, you know, when you're on a national pavilion, this yeah. kind of the national focus comes yeah. upon it. You and know, all these people like you guys yeah. back home are like rooting for you. Absolutely. You know, New Zealand being one of the tiny countries, it's you know, relatively yeah. new to the Biennale. It's quite the, the emphasis at home when whoever is representing is yeah. quite, you know, And there's lots of silly focused. things said there, like, yeah. oh, it's like the Olympics of the art world. It's like, it's not a competition, it's yeah. art. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's quite, it's quite a, a different process. Yeah. But do you work only in London, or do you no, also go back uh, to well, New actually, Zealand? My f I really like working on residencies, and in Brazil, one of my favorite residencies where 
um, actually the bronze in, in, in this show was originally made out of balata, but you say it in a different way, don't you? You say borasha. And um, it's a kind of rubber. I think there's five or six kinds of rubbers in, in Belém, in the, in, the north of, of, um, in the north of Brazil. And it's a, a rubber extracted straight from the tree. And it is, um, I, I heat it up in hot water until it's malleable. And then I sculpt it in cold water. So it's quite crazy to work with. I have to work with it very fast because as, as it's in the cold water, it's, it's hardening up again. And my hands are hot and cold. And I also work with it with a different scale. The person I learned from, his scale is um, usually about this big to this big. And, and my piece is now from the floor to here, like 150, I think, high. So um, I really like working in other places. In New Zealand, I work at mums and dads quite a lot, or at our mutual friend's house a lot. Travel a lot, I presume. Yeah, I travel a lot. <laughs> My husband's Italian, so I work a lot here too. Okay. And I know your husband is Italian, and he's also a designer uh, whose uh, work is very near to art uh, in some ways. How do you? And I know you also work with him sometimes on uh, like the pedestals. Yeah, for I example, think for his, with the yeah. pedestals for here, he's uh, he did the technical drawings for me. Okay. Yeah, I said I wanted this big. But also because he's introduced me to people like Carlo Scarpa and you know all the Italian amazing architects and designers. Yeah, and so of course. It's been super helpful for me. So how do you like? Uh, how is your relationship when you're working together? So we have a studio and it's okay. in three parts. One is a huge table, almost this size. In fact, it's longer than this, but a bit thinner. And we have lunch. We have cooked lunch in the studio every day. I work by myself, but Martino has often up to five or six or seven assistants and so we always eat together we're always talking about art and and design and work problems and you know usually we're he's working with younger people so it's really nice to be able to help them see how an artist works and and to discuss problems quite frankly and money quite frankly in front of other people so that they can learn from our mistakes or or learn from where we don't where we get it right about business and and, but when, like, when he does things for you, is it you who tell him, I want this, 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 or is, uh, does he put a lot of his into it and you leave him like freedom or how? Um, both. Th both. Both. So both, both. Sometimes, for example, this one, he had the great idea to um, do my plinth in mar marino, which is a t Venetian um, plaster. Yeah. Sure. So that's the kind of knowledge that he brings, and okay. he can also do the technical drawings very well, but it's very simple, it's just a rectangle. Yeah. But then other times we've shown, say for example, with Kate McGarry in London, or Anton Kern in New York, and he's made his furniture, and I put my sculptures on his furniture, so that's a very different way of okay. um, working. Somebody you wanted to ask a question? I was just wondering what you thought maybe the biggest advantage was of coming from a country where there isn't that... Um, like artistic um, like, uh, density, I guess. I mean, I'm from Canada, and I think New Zealand is fairly similar. Uh, it's not something that you grow up with, having major institutions and major shows all the time. And so how do you think that has positively influenced your practice? Well, I think I was super lucky that I never thought that I'd make money as an artist. I thought I'd be probably a teacher or a gardener or something, and then be an artist on the weekend when, when after making my money. So I never had this expectation of having a career I didn't know artists could have careers in New Zealand. And um, that's really useful because it, you know, you don't make art for the market. I think if you come from this kind of society, you make art for yourself and for your own interests. And, and then, yeah, it's, it, it's really relaxing. I, I feel really lucky and I, I, I purposely, when I came to England, didn't do a master's or study any further because I didn't want to be corrupted by that system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh. So in our studio lunches, everyone talks. So any, any, come on, yeah. come on, people. Participate, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask whatever you. Hello. Uh, I was just picked up from the crowd there to participate, but. Um, 
but I am, uh, I'm from Czech Republic and I am a student of uh, film, documentary. And um, I, have a, I came to this Biennale this year asking a kind of a personal and maybe a bit naive question, but I found myself asking it quite often. And that is, how can I tell that I am an artist? <laughs> I've been an artist. I don't know. I, my, my, my brothers and sisters all, like, my sister makes jewellery and my brother makes sculptures out of rocks and my other brothers make sort of weird inventions out of LEDs and, um, and electronics. And I think there's very little between their intention and my intention and also our processes. I guess the difference is that I do it every day and they don't always have time to. Um, I don't know, and that's why I'm really intrigued working alongside my husband, who's a designer and kind of in the art world, kind of, but he is definitely a designer and I'm definitely an artist. And, and I I've got a jeweler friend too, and he's definitely a jeweler. And, but to me, they're exactly like little sculptures. So maybe I'm not the person to ask because I'm so confused about this. And I don't think it matters. And I think that maybe one day you're a documentary filmmaker and then the next day you might have this vision that you want to make something that's completely esoteric and then you'll suddenly not be a documentary filmmaker and you'll be an artist. And defining that's not particularly useful. And the art world seems to be more and more happy with segueing between these things too, I think. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of how I feel about it. Mm. I just, that reading, I really started asking it reading the... Um, you know the premise of this biennale, and and there, the you know it's asking the question itself, right? Mm. Like who is an artist and what's mm. their responsibilities, and and then I sort of began to ask myself, like, is it, you know, it's just so yeah. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Paulo Bruschi for this uh, international language. Obrigado pela linguagem internacional. <laughs> Eu já sei que o Paulo está aí é, no trabalho, né? Mas que livros comprou o Paulo na livraria? What kind she, of books Paulo is uh, choosing in the library? I think it's the most interesting because I, I love your books and I love the way you, you buy your books. <laughs> Uh, so far he's only looked and he's, uh, he's found one album that he likes but he's still about to do his excursion for book hunting. He has a personal library of over a thousand artist books and he has an archive of over 70,000 documents, one of the largest in Latin America. And who says at home? Um, you have It's an or actual archive, a sort of institute of two stories and then two apartments as well. So the Galleria Ana Rosler APC, which is the Association for Contemporary Patronage, and uh, Itaú Cultural through Alfredo Setúbal, 
have created a institute which has just been approved by the Ministry of Culture to catalog and preserve his entire archive because for him it's very important in life to have that organized so that people can research it from all over the world. Fantastic. Um, I have a question. Um, when, when, you, uh, when, you, when you say there are 70,000 documents, are these documents, documentations of like actions or works or what's, what, what are the ra what's the range of these documents? Because it's quite an open from an English perspective, at least, that's a very broad description of things, right? You know, 70,000 things, if you will. Yeah. Na descrição de 70 mil, o que é que tem nesse arquivo? De Fluxo tem cerca de 1.500 obras. Do Gutai tem vários projetos de Saburo Murakami, correspondência. De Shoji Shimamoto, eu tenho cerca de 150 obras. Eu me, me correspondi com ele desde os anos 70 até ele morrer há dois anos atrás. Aí tenho de, de, de Marei, Breton, publicações, de todo, algumas publicações originais do dadaísmo, do futurismo, e do Brasil e da Itália. Eu considero a Itália o maior centro da poesia visual do mundo. A Itália não existe outro país igual a Itália na, na, na poesia visual. E eu me correspondi aqui com o Eugênio Mitini, Sarenko. There's everything from... He has over 1,500 artworks from the Fluxus movement. He corresponded in artworks from various Gutai artists, but also first editions, publications, uh, documents of Breton, uh, a lot of the futurism, Dadaism. He considers Italy to be the center of visual poetry, and that's a very important element to his archive as well. From, he has correspondence with Christos, David Hockney. They all participated in um, events that he would organize in Recife, his hometown. Openheim, letters. And in which city is this? With this, this is all in Recife, Pernambuco, in the northeast of Brazil. And if someone wants to visit, do you, how, how, do you, how do you visit? Como você visita o arquivo? No, no, if the people want to visit, how do you do it? I receive critics from all over the world. He receives critics from all over the world, researchers from all over the world. In the 70s in Argentina, recently, the investigators went there, because in America Latina, all the production of America Latina was destroyed by the dictators. In America Latina, there was a dictator during the end of the 60s, and during the 80s, there was only a opening at the beginning dos anos 80. Então foram destruídos, é, eu fui preso, cada meu arte, Clemente Padim, é, Horácio Zavala, é, é, Ligardo Vigo, é, Ulisses, é, Jorge Carabarro, é, é, Ligardo Vigo. Né? Então houve muitas prisões na América Latina dos anos 70 e eles destruíram os arquivos, as obras. E então eu tenho toda a documentação, principalmente da América Latina, onde os pesquisadores agora da Argentina foram lá porque the majority of art uh, was destroyed during the dictatorship in all of Latin America, starting at the end of the 60s until the mid 80s. And so a lot of researchers, for example, uh, from Argentina have been spending a lot of time as in archive, finding all of these things of Zabala, Vigo, people that were, like he says, there were jails all over Latin America. And he is one of the sources of these Artworks and documents and exchanges, correspondence. And did he hide them? Did you, did you hide them? Like, like how did they escape? Sim, esse material. Numa, numa prisão minha, eles destruíram uma, algumas coisas minhas e ficou anexado ao, ao processo na justiça militar, que até hoje eu não sei onde foi parar. E... A, a lot of his work when he was in jail was destroyed and some was annexed to his, uh, his process mm -hmm. uh, and is still there. He still doesn't know where some of those works are. Eu ganhei a beca da Guggenheim em 81, em 82 eu, li, eu, eu morei em Nova York e tive com um, é, Dick Higgins, fiz uma performance com Ken Friedman, eu me correspondo até hoje com Ken Friedman né? e outros integrantes do, do, do Grupo Fluxo né? na Inglaterra, Robin Crozier, que ele doou recente até o, o, o arquivo dele para a Tate Gallery. In 1981, he won the Guggenheim 
Grant and in 82 moved to New York and he did performances and works with Dickie Higgins and Ken Freeman and who's, they've published his work and uh, most recently one of the archives of Quem está no Tate? Quem comp- o arquivo que acabou no Tate? Robbie Cruzeas. Robbie Cruzeas, of England, who recently was acquired by the Tate. There's a lot of his work in that. So there was this constant. Philip Ehrenberg, que é mexicano, que, que é um artista importante, que editou tudo do Fluxo no, nos anos 70. Então, ele edita as primeiras publicações de vários artistas do, do Fluxo nos anos 70. Tem uma parte do, dos anos 60 que Dick Higgs, que tinha editora, publicou, porque ninguém queria saber do fluxo, ninguém queria editar fluxo. E só foram editados por causa de... Só foram porque o próprio Dick Higgs tinha um editor. Uh, someone like Felipe Edenberg from Mexico, who was publishing all of these books for fluxos, or yeah. Dickie Higgins who had his own publishing house, that was one of the things that was preserving what was happening, because no one wanted to publish on fluxos. Eu fiz uma performance com Ken Friedman, Regina Vater. Eu fiz uma performance com Ken Friedman, Regina Vater estava presente. Jantamos no, no restaurante que o, o Grupo Fluxo sempre comia e depois saímos andando, já era tarde da noite, e um cachorro do outro lado do muro, tinha um cachorro do outro lado do muro e saiu acompanhando a gente, de a gente do lado de cada muro. Então, eu e quem Friedman convidou Regina Navata para sentar do outro lado, embaixo de um poste. Ele foi para a ponta do muro, eu fui para a outra ponta do muro. E saímos dizendo coisas onomatopaicas. E ele de lá, e eu de cá. E o cachorro fazia. Um, 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 um. Quando nos encontramos, saímos calados. E o cachorro no outro lado. A performance foi isso. Ele wants to a performance in New York with Ken Friedman for a dog. It was a performance that Regina Van uh, witnessed. They were coming out of a restaurant and then came up to this little street and up on a rooftop was a dog barking, barking, barking. And so they decided to do a performance where he stood on one end of the wall and Ken Friedman on the other, and they decided to just shout out onomatopoeic sounds, which he just made. And as they came to each other, they just turned in silence. (laughs) Could you please take the microphone? Se você foi para prisão por suas palavras ou por sua arte? E se é possível separar essas duas coisas? Não, a vida de arte para mim é integrada, não faço diferença. Foi pelo menos eu fiz muito rap nos anos 60, 70 e continuo fazendo trabalho de rua, né? Porque eu Mário Pedrosa né, já, já tem uma, uma frase que, que era de Sica, usa muito, que é experimentar o experimental, que é, um, é uma coisa... Eu trabalho, a minha obra, eu trabalho com os sólidos, os líquidos e os gasosos, com a esperança, a nacionalidade e a solidão, da primeira à quarta dimensão. For him, art is life, so there is no difference. And he's been doing happenings and working on the street forever. And he, he thinks a lot of something that Mario Pedrosa said, a Brazilian critic, and Elio Itzica used to say, which is, I experiment with the experimental. Agora, repite o que você falou. Oh, oh yeah, so it is. Okay, so my work is. I work with solid, liquid, and gas. Hope. Nationality. And loneliness. To the fir- from the first to the fourth dimension. When I work with the machines, they are co-authors. Está sempre ao meu lado o acaso. By my side is always chance, uh, a pesquisa, research, e a intuição. and intuition. Yeah, you can just ask. 
Yes. Hello. Do you think that your work follows the same rules? Yes, I do. Yeah. I was going to ask a similar thing because obviously yeah. chance, you know, in, in any creative practice, it's always a combination of sort of research and the things that you're thinking about that inform the work and then as you do it, that sense of chance comes in. Do you want to talk about chance in your work a little bit? Well, chance for me, well, you know, you have this idea about making a work, well, I do, and then it's never anything like you hope or dream, and um, it's always worse and better simultaneously. And, um, and also the chance of, for example, you know, going to Brazil and finding this new material. Materials are really important to my work, and, and finding new materials for me is often by chance or... I work a lot with ceramics now, and by chance, I grew up in a city full of potters, and by chance, our family was really good friends with a really, really super amazing potter who's a hermit and lives alone, and he's very generous to me and lets me go and work with him in the middle of nowhere in New Zealand, and that feels like chance, that kind of thing, but it is also something that I research, and it's also something that I really work on, the, the relationships, and... Yeah, and... And my research is quite chancy too. I love to wa wander into museums and just uh, sort of let things flow and let things find me a little bit. And, and that, that also feels like that too. But you're also very methodical as well. Could you please, could you please take, use the microphone because otherwise nobody so hears the question. But I, was, I was just saying that you work in a very methodical way as well. I think I set it up methodical, and then I go crazy after that. So, um, yeah, it's sort of set up, and then it just gives me room. Because yeah, I'm a very organized person, but, you know, make art, so I'm obviously crazy as well. So, yeah. um, Hello. Paulo, uh, posso falar em português? Sim. De Portugal? <laughs> adoro Portugal. E eu adoro o Brasil. <laughs> Um, Paulo, uh, a questão é, um, eu tive a sorte de conhecer uma série de artistas, uh, alguns que já faleceram, como o Cesarini, uh, conheço o Meli Castro, sou amigo do Meli Castro, que está a viver no, exato, que está a viver no Brasil, e, e nos últimos anos de vida conheci o Otto Mull, do accionismo vienense. O Otto Mull foi muito perseguido, mais tarde na Áustria, e, e inclusivamente preso, uh, e, e ele dizia-me que uh, cegaram-no numa vista na prisão uh, e que queriam mesmo matá-lo no, no regime do, do Eider, o presidente de extrema-direita que a Áustria teve. De tal forma que ele depois saiu da Áustria e foi viver para Portugal, arranjou uma pequena comunidade. Eu estive a passar o fim de ano com essa comunidade, já depois dele morrer, este fim de ano, não é? Sim. Um, e a questão é, uh, e a pergunta, eu também tenho uma coleção, enfim, não tão boa, de certeza, mas uh, sobre a questão da poesia visual e do, do, da performance art, etc. Uh, a minha questão é se uh, uh, alguma vez teve contato com todos esses autores do, do accionismo vienense e se de alguma forma pode ter relação também entre as problemáticas que eles se colocavam na altura, não é? E aquilo que nós estamos a viver hoje, uh, não só no Brasil, não é? Ver, uh, nos Estados Unidos também há, uh, demitiram o, o, o presidente do FBI que, que estava a investigar a questão do, da interferência russa não é? nas eleições americanas. E, portanto, isto é um problema que se está a colocar a todo o mundo, não é? E se de alguma forma havia relação e depois extrapolando para o dia 2, não é? Se há necessidade de um outro movimento que possa também dar uma expressão viva a esta uh, problemática mundial, não é? Atual. Desculpa, a pergunta tão longa. Não, tudo bem. Eu, eu, uh, inclusive... Can I just sort of interrupt you? Just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> at least a, a, a small <laughs> bit for... I'm going to try... I'm going to... You can also make it short. I'm going to synthesize it just a little bit. Okay. You're from Portugal, you also have an archive, you were also in contact with writers and artists uh, that suffered the same kind of repression uh, in Portugal and in Austria? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I spoke about Otto Mool. And Otto uh, Mool. Uh, exactly. Uh, Actionism uh, nice. And I think the question was about whether in the world that we live in today, where similar things are happening, not just in Brazil, but also with the governments like Trump and Russia being involved in what happened with the elections and the recent firing of the FBI president, if it's not time to have another movement that, you know, reacts to these kind of things. But you were also wondering whether he had been in contact with this group. Eu tive, eu sempre tive muito contato com, com artistas de Portugal e já participei de, de, das lusografias na, na Universidade de Évora, onde eu fiz uma palestra sobre a história da poesia visual brasileira, começando de Gregório de Matos né, até a contemporaneidade. E Mery Castro é amigo meu há muitas décadas, que eu acho um dos melhores poetas visuais do mundo. E várias pessoas do Grupo Zero de, de, de Lisboa, que fizeram uma publicação muito rara, que é uma caixa. E, em 80, na década de 80, 84, por aí, eu levei Mery Castro para o Recife com uma exposição histórica da poesia visual portuguesa, com os mortos, com os vivos, uma exposição, e ele me deu para o meu arquivo depois, quando terminou a exposição. Então, quer dizer, eu, eu tenho toda a história da poesia, antologias, né? eu sempre estou comprando, procurando me informar o que está acontecendo, o que está... e comprando, além de eu ganhar várias coisas, eu compro também. Toda viagem eu pago excesso de bagagem. Né? E, e Portugal, eu tenho contato com Fernando Aguiar, de performance, levei ele para o Brasil, para Fortaleza, fizemos performance junto na, na Feira do Livro de, de, de Fortaleza. So he um, has a lot of contact with Portugal. He was actually invited to give a talk at the University of Nevora uh, on visual poetry. And he also was a friend and collaborator with, como chama o português, desculpa? Mary Castro. Mary Castro, and invited him to, to do a large show of visual poetry in Brazil. Um, he had correspondence with the Zero Group as well, that did a very rare publication that was just a box. But for him, it's a very important uh, exchange. No. Ele falou de uma coisa importante que disse que está acontecendo no mundo todo. E eu acho que Marcel foi muito feliz né, de botar o tema arte e vida arte, porque é uma questão como ele levantou que, que para ser discutida no mundo todo o que está acontecendo. Né, que, é, que é, um, um, é um extermínio da humanidade, como nunca houve na história, eu acho. E muita gente não está nem aí, não está nem pensando sobre isso, o que está acontecendo, o que está por trás de tudo isso. Né. He thinks that uh, Christine Marcel's idea of working with Viva Arte Viva was very opportune. Uh, he thinks that it, we're going through a period in which there's mass extermination like he's never seen it and people are not even paying attention and these kind of things draw attention for, to what the world we're living in today. In a good way or bad way? In a wrong way? In a good way. In a good way. In a good way. Hi, I have a question for Francis. Uh, I have to say, firstly, that I really fell in love with uh, with your work, with your characters. So I, um, I think we can say that each one of them has a, a really uh, a unique personality. So I would like to know how do you, uh, what do you inspire, uh, what you you are inspired by when you when you think, when you create, and uh, if you. Each time you think about one uh, work or time, or if you think about more a sort of narration, a story, or yeah. Well, um, is this going? Hello, hello. No. It's not on mute though. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Okay. Um, I don't call them characters actually. I really think of them as sculptures. And um, it's kind of hard to say how and why, but. Um, the word character to me is if they have a personality, and to me, 
the only personality in the sculptures is mine. So, you know, it's always me making the sculptures. So even though the different ethnicities or different colors or heights or sexes, it's, it's, it's always my character that's on them. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Hey Francis, I was, um, and Paolo too, I was thinking about kind of commonalities between you. Obviously, there's fundamental aspects one might conceive as being quite different in what you do, but when I think of the figuration in your work, there's a really strong performative aspect in the sculptures. And a um, couple of questions I wanted to ask you. Have you ever done a performance? Have you ever done performances? Um, at art school, yeah, but right. that was quite a long time okay. ago. Okay, yeah, yeah, and and so therefore, um, the the kind of the, I might say at least the choreography or the or the sense of movement and the figures. Would you like to talk about that in terms of it being kind of performative, even though that they're static figures, if you will? Well, I was a dancer oh. when I, at school when I was a kid, and I always thought I was going to be a dancer, and then I was going to be a violinist, and then suddenly at fifteen I realised that art was it. So. Maybe that kind of movement and thing is really important to me. Also, I do a lot of yoga, and so, and also I'm really, really, really fascinated by bodies and people. I love going to the sauna. Where my, my husband's from the north of Italy, and they have a lot of sauna, and I love going to the sauna and like <laughs> just seeing all the different kinds of bodies that humans can have. And also, I go to Japan a lot. In Japan, you're in the onsen, and women's bodies in Japan are extremely different from mine and I'm always staring at them, and they're always staring at me. And um, I like it, and, um, but I do really like Christine's idea about this show as a humanist show that's not about extremes of religions or sexes or anything, but it's actually about humans. And I, I'm, I think with my works, even though they're from obviously different ethnicities, or even though they're not, because they're sculptures, they're not, you couldn't say that one is a Japanese sculpture, because it's not, it's made by me. It's looking a bit like a Japanese sculpture. And so, but I like to think of them as humans. And, and I think that's the point of my work at the moment is that they're all humans and there are some animals. But there's animals and humans, not, um, not people from one place or another. Because in Britain too, we're having some political issues. And um, I think we need to start remembering that all humans should have the same rights. So we are nearly running out of time. We're at coffee. Uh, is there, if there are one or two other questions. And, uh, okay. Uh, there's something in this program of the Biennale that I found really interesting that was the, uh, uh, that Christine asked the artist to, uh, to list uh, some books that uh, influenced them in their practice. Uh, so I would like to ask both of you guys about the books that you picked, and uh, if you could speak a little bit about uh, the influence of these books in your practice. I might have to open my catalog and read what I wrote. I, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know where I put my catalog. I can't remember. But I read a lot of literature. I don't read a lot of um, non-fiction. I read pretty much only fiction. Um, instead of catalog texts for my for books and things, I always commission authors, and I ask them to write alongside my work rather than about it, exactly because I think that art should be self-evident and having it explained is not very useful. At the moment, what I'm reading mostly is Octavia Butler, who's, um, who's I think she died in the 90s, but she's um, a black African-American writer and writing amazing sci-fi and really, really super forward. And um, I read a lot of literature and sci-fi and I really like these sort of, and she thinks of humans and aliens, she uses the, Humans, often in her novels, are, are one race, and then there's the aliens, which she uses a metaphor for different types of people, which I find super fascinating. So if I'd rewritten that book, the, 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 my list this week, it would be actually a long list of Octavia Butler books. I think I, I've read one, and then I just read every single one I could find. They're fascinating. And I really recommend, because she's not well known in Europe or New Zealand. And what about you? Can you remember? <laughs> é, as funções da, da pintura de Leger, os meios, é, as funções, as funções da pintura de Leger, 
functions of painting by Leger. Os meios são as massagens de McLuhan. The medium is the message by McLuhan. McLuhan. O o choque do futuro de Alvin Toffler, que nos anos 70 ele já já sabia o que ia acontecer até agora. É um livro que você eu li na década de 70 e e foi acontecendo tudo o que está no livro de Alvin Toffler. E The Shock of the Future by Alvin Toflin, which he wrote in the 1970s, and in the 70s he already knew everything that was going to happen in the future, and he reread it recently, and it really is the world we live in today. In 1984. 1984 by Orwell. George, I confuse George Orwell, from the United States, that he knew what Trump would do. Quer dizer, 1984 é um livro onde nem na sua casa você tem um espaço para não ser vigiado. E na Alemanha, por exemplo, existem bonecas atualmente que estão sendo recolhidas com filmadoras né, e com som para gravar. Então, a espionagem hoje no mundo é uma coisa comum. Você não tem mais a sua, as televisões lhe filma, lhe grava. Então você não tem mais. 1980 e os, 1984 é é o que acontece, vem acontecendo com a questão da espionagem no mundo todo. Né? 1984 is the world we're living in today, in which everything is surveillance. Your TV is capturing you. There are these dolls in Germany where the eyes are recording sound and image, and so there's nowhere to escape. We live in that world today. E, para finalizar, eu, eu tenho um livro que chama-se Viva a Poesia Viva, que é de dois anos atrás. É uma que, que coincide com o mesmo tema, como eu trabalho sempre com vida e arte, com o mesmo tema do, da Biennale. E, finalmente, um livro dele, chamado Viva a Poesia Viva, de dois anos atrás. Alguém That falta o, o, o poema linguístico? Está o poema? Todos têm o poema? Sim. Eu acho que sim. Agora... Uh, we can all eu, put eu, it não, eu, é, um momento. Eu quando sair daqui, eu vou fazer uma outra sonografia que me documentar minha obra interna. When I leave here, I'm going to do an ultrasound to document my entire performance. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if there is a last question by somebody wants to ask because we've reached the end of our today's Tavola Aperta. Uh, so if there are no any other questions, I really want to thank our two artists guests today, Francis Superchard and uh, Paolo Bruschi. And, Paolo, and also so especially Paolo oh, for his linguistic poem. Yeah. Thank, uh, you so much. thank you very much for being with us today. I also thank all the guests who share this lunch. Uh, um, I remind you that we are here again uh, to the, tomorrow and the day after, and we will be here with open tables until the end of the exhibition. So whoever wishes to book online uh, during the exhibition, you're welcome. And enjoy the, the exhibition. Uh, I'm sorry for the weather today, but uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.